Uh, welcome to Helping Organizations Thrive. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of Tony Wormsley. Uh, welcome, Tony. Thanks very much, Julian. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. I know we spoke a while back about you coming on the show, so it's good that the, today is the live date. Uh, I just want to tell the audience a little bit about you, uh, which I think you've got a really interesting uh, background. You've had 25 years in professional football, and you've won uh, sort of league titles, um, national championships, and also you had sort of held head roles in sort of various A League, and also the Olympic Athletes Program uh, through Manchester United, and also Tranmere Rovers, both in in different countries as well. So, wealth experience in sports, uh, but now you've obviously transitioned laterally now into more business leadership and coaching, uh, where you enhance uh, performance through coaching and psychological profiling using lessons and experience that you've learned uh, from professional sports to help organizations achieve a competitive advantage. So I'm sure that sport will, will come out in all what you're saying and that's been part of you for many years. Um, and the first question I always ask every guest really, because I really know what people's passion and why is it what you love about uh, what you do. That's a great question, Julian. Uh, and I think my simple answer is I've, I have a vision for stronger people. And, and I landed on that when when I decided, you know, you, you never say never. But when I stopped, you know, I'm not in football at the moment. I'm not working for a, a business at the moment. I set up my own business, which was to, to become purpose led. And it was identifying that purpose that was hmm. critical to what I do enjoy about what I do now, which is taking those you know, getting a real, I suppose, depth of understanding of what performance means in the context of what people do, whether that's sport or business, and then mm. seeing the transformation that can happen quite quickly when you help uh, challenged managers and teams that are underperforming to turn that around. And, and you know, it doesn't take too too long or too much to, to do that. So I love... Um, I love that that's a really complex challenge because each challenge is unique. Mm. Um, but fundamentally, it's it, the, the driver within me is about helping people um, be better at who they are and what they do. Brilliant. And, and, and has that always been part of you in terms of through your sort of football career? Or is it has, but it's become more evident in the latter part of your career? Yeah, I think it's always been there in in, in an innate way, you know, a care for other people and and um, and, and a love of sport took me down a, a career that I, I didn't expect or know I was going to, you know, I didn't know I was going to be a 25 year football professional, didn't make it as a player and, and uh, you know, left English shores in the um, sort of late 80s to, to coach a you know, a second tier team in in Australia as a 21 year old player coach. So I had no idea really about leadership at, at that point, other than taking myself into situations. Mm. Um, and it became, you know, one success led to another, and, and that became a a career in pursuit of of a very uh, enriching and rewarding experience over a long period of time. But of course, entrepreneurially, I was always stepping outside of the game to to seek. You know, when I look back, I was always stepping outside of the game to, to look at what else was out there. Mm. Made some significant transitions into, you know, big business um, around eight, just a bit more than eight years ago now. And there was something in that on reflection that suggests that, you know, and on, on reflection that suggests that it wasn't football that was the the lure or the driver. It was There was something else. And, there, you know, there was a part of that process which was uncovering, you know, what fundamentally is is what what motivates me. Brilliant. It's interesting because it, it probably took me about 20 years to realise that I um, love unlocking somebody's potential. And uh, as I reflected a number of years ago, as I look back, I started to realise that's where I got more excited, uh, having been in the sort of sales and sort of commercial world. Uh, it was actually seeing people um transforming uh, their own behaviors to make a greater impact so sometimes it is a reflective things of knowing your purpose because i know we talk a lot about purpose in our lives yeah. um i really want to explore because i'm quite interested in looking at the whole 
sport and business and the, the parallels there is um, in, in terms of high performance. Um, you know, quite a keen uh, sort of watcher of, of various sports. Um, and I always love, love to see how that sort of uh, sort of uh, is mirrored, really, because I think there is some sort of analogies or, or sort of crossovers in how you, you view that. But before we go there, I'd like to understand from your perspective how you would define high performance in the context of sport and business. And are they different or are they same? Well, the common, the common thread is people, what motivates people, what stresses them out. What, uh, and, and the other the other thing is performance is, is contextual or situational. So um, th those two things count. Um, I think if you think about from a sporting perspective and language I used to use frequently was that, you know, what as a, as a coach of a football team, what, what, what do you actually want? You want your players under under match conditions under scrutiny under pressure to make independent decisions and mm. be responsible for that and that and they come off in in, a, in an ideal world that works the fans are happy the players happy everyone gets a, a kick yeah. out of it or if it doesn't work they have the resilience to bounce back quickly and and go again so you know that they're, they're, they're sort of performance in a nutshell independent uh, you know, take responsibility for independent decisions that have consequences under mm. scrutiny, and you've got, you know, perform. You either the, the game demands that, or in the work environment, the business demands that, and then it's then it's up to you. Now, the the complexity then for the manager is who is you know the manager in the football context or the manager of a team in an operational environment. I'm responsible for that. So I'm I'm responsible for what what happens and how far I go in stretching people towards being better um, that keeps them uh, in a state where they feel like they can achieve it and not too fearful mm. is like an optimum state to get people into and I, I had a lot of success with that um, but I've also failed big when I've when I, when my vision of what what was possible was too big a step for people in terms of a state of readiness to go and mm. you know to, to try to try and meet so i wasn't close enough to the individuals to to really recognize that hang on a second what the demands that the game already was demanding a lot of them the extra demands that i might have put on them as a manager mm. was perhaps uh, one step too far you know and, and i think it's important for for leaders and managers to recognize that what they might think is a good idea at the time you might be, you might be the the lone voice in a in a crowd and and not often and often people won't um if, if you're in that position of power won't maybe have perhaps have the courage or authenticity to come forward and, mm. and have an honest dialogue about where they're at with what it is that you're trying mm. to do so performance is is contextual i think there's two things that that are that have to be have to be good and i think there's two big gaps what one is environment getting the right people in the right place most of the time um and failure to do that means disengagement it means loss of energy it means mm. stress you know if people are spending too long outside of the their own natural state in 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 situations that motivate them the the absolute opposite of that is stress there's accumulation of stress and it mm. it often accumulates unseen um, and then it's management. It's it's managers who have enough self awareness to recognise how different they are from everybody else that they're trying to work with. And mm. I think a lot of managers fail to do that. So they set about a task or a job as a as a manager. You use a a salesperson, go you know, successful salesperson for three years gets promoted to sales manager, and. The, the things they know about success were what they did as a salesperson that no longer have the same application in, mm. in management and they can get lost very, very quickly. So performance is in, is in context. And if I could just add, there's a couple of things I think that are, that are different. In sport, the players who are, you know, in the hierarchy of the organisation uh, who the players that do the work that add the value they're the people that score the goals and and, and stop the goals and get the results at the end of the day 
um, they actually, when they're being asked to perform, they're only being asked to perform for a very short time in the week, say two hours out of the week, where they're under scrutiny and there's consequences for, for failure. Mm. The rest of the time, the, the bulk of time is spent recovering, recuperating, preparing, analysing, mm. getting ready to to go again with all the data that's available to them and with a mm. huge support network around them, lots of positive energy. Mm. Um, and it's relatively easy to and simple to say, well, this group knows exactly where we're going and what we need to do. At the end of the week, we play this team and we need to score one more goal than they do. It's mm. really quite simple. Whereas you take that to an operational environment, which where, where I'm working at the moment, the people that do the work that adds the most value, that build the machinery or, or the equipment, um, are paid less. They don't have a thousand fans yelling at them, good or bad, when things are in the moment. But they're being asked to perform at match pace for eight hours a day mm. with no time to breathe, no time to, to step back. Now, unless businesses, and I'm pretty sure they're not, are getting this environment and this self-aware manager in situ in the right way, for that period of time, over those extended periods, I'm not surprised that the stats on wellness and engagement and productivity mm. are where they're at globally because it's it's a very complex thing and it cannot be managed well that way. That's interesting because it, it's uh, that I like that difference where you have that sort of high performance with the players for a couple of hours a week and then that the rest of the time is all about recuperating and taking some time out which in some ways are some real lessons there that we, we shouldn't be expected to be performing at top whack all the time because it just physically is not sustainable and making sure that as, as, as leaders, leaders are making sure they're looking out for their, their people and their teams to give those timeouts and look at after their well-being, their mental health, all that aspects which are really vital for sustainability. And it's interesting you put, you know, people at the, at the core of high performance and, you made that sort of difference where I guess people who perform at a high performers are, are sort of independent in terms of how they sort of operate. How much of the responsibility of high performance is on the leader or the, the direct or, or the, the direct report? Where do you think the balance should be? Because we all have a responsibility and how would you play that out in, in an organization? It, it, it's very important to understand who who we're talking about. So who are the subjects in this sort of hypothetical exercise? So who's the manager and what what are the natural strengths and weaknesses? If we've got the presupposition that there's no one type of person makes a great manager, which I truly believe, they're just going to manage in different ways. Mm. Then from an organisational perspective, uh, understanding the demands of the job, the types of people that will do well in those jobs and um, having a manager then who understands where they're coming from and how to get the people out in that context is absolutely critical. So I think where, where everybody from the top down takes ultimate responsibility for everything beneath them, you've got an optimal environment now that's you know we think about i think about culture as as like a, a three-tiered hierarchy of resolution so cult, organizational culture is really low resolution it's idealistic um it's the leaders have sat around the table and said we want to be this this is what we stand for this is what wow. our customer experience looks like then you've got the relationships that happen so the people you bring together who've each got their own i suppose pyramid of values and and, mm -hmm. and purpose and reason why they're doing something and even higher resolution what drives them what motivates them um what 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 scares them what things they like to avoid so they bring these different world views into that ideal cultural environment the business has constructed mm. and then at, at the broadest level you've got the interactions that they play so the conversations that people have with each other and I, I believe the, the 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 culture is as good as um, the way that that what people say is interpreted. So how it's intended is understood. If that's if that's matched up really well. So if we learn how to 
have dialogue with positive intention that is understood. So here's my frame of reference. This is what mm. I mean. When I say this, this is what I mean. And you understand that that's what I mean. And you're not making your own assumptions about it meant something else. Mm. Or you took offense or you got defensive. Yeah. The, 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 the idealistic culture is fantastic. What happens in the conversations is where bit by bit, the friction grows, things get misinterpreted, mi misunderstood. And there's mm. a ton of work to do in, in that. The piece in the middle to answer your question is I think the responsibility sits with the individual and the direct reports. So I am so if I'm a football coach, I'm responsible for the performance of the team. Um, they are responsible for the performance of their role, or if they're mm. part of a team unit, you know, if it's the defense. Um, or when we're when we're uh, without the ball, we're all part of the defence. So we have responsibilities that that that, that mm. count. They're accountable for doing. You know, even if you're the centre forward, you're accountable for doing some defensive work of some description. Mm. So I think it filters down like that. And then the hierarchy of the organisation, the club chairman or the or or the the leader of of operations or or supply chain. Um, they have nowhere to hide. They must be um, responsible. And that's why the CEOs get paid the big bucks because ultimately the, the, the buck stops with with them. But there has to be a, a sharing of, of that responsibility as it goes down and it needs to be clearly understood. Yeah, no, and I agree. And it's that, whether it's CEO or, or a leader, it, it creates the environment, the sense of the vision, doesn't it, in terms of inspiring people, yeah. providing the support and all the resources each player or each employee plays their own role and responsibility and they've got to sort of step up to that and can't put a blaming, you know, obviously, oh, it's my boss, it's my boss is this, but actually you've got to take some action as well and be part of that equation. Uh, yes. And it's like a, it's like a twofold impact that goes on there in terms of that sharing. Um, just looking back over the last sort of 12 months, how have you, do you think high performance or, expectations of that or the and i'll bring in a a, a football analogy of do the of the goalposts changed over that time in terms of how we view high performance how we should view high performance i, I think the uh, to use the analogy that the it, it's the game that demands what what performance is so if you let's say you're an academy player who's making your first team debut and you step into the first thing, you've never been there before, you never experienced it before, you, you might be excited, you might be terrified, whatever. Um, the game doesn't care about that, doesn't care how old you are, how many games you've played, it will present mm. you with challenges that you'll either meet or you won't meet on the day, and that's the demand. Mm. And, and the, the demand um, uh, is if you like, is fixed or it's fixed by the business that we need to get this many boxes out by five o'clock. We need to score more goals than the opposition, whatever it might be. So that's that hasn't changed. Mm. I think it's the circumstances within which those demands um, are being realised are what's changed and it's people's adaptability. You know, I read a lot of research at the moment that, that talks about people looking for managers who can operate in chaos. You know, it's never been more, uh, that, that need has never been more prevalent than it is now. It's not just mm. COVID, but it's digital transformation. It's industry 4.0. There's pe people are living in this, this state of, uh, of, of much quicker change and, and, you know, AI and machine learning and all these things that are coming mm. in that change the way people work that, to be successful in that environment requires adaptability and resilience and and, mm. and all those things and it, it puts it puts added pressure on people but to, to, to take covid as an example um and one one really clear example for me about what has changed is that the demand of people going to work is fixed it was the same before covid it's the same after it may be different because the business has downsized and they've had to let people go. Mm. And now people have taken on more roles or different roles or wearing two hats. So that's mm. become 
immediately more challenging, especially if they've they've just put people into positions without due care and attention. But there's another piece to it, which is even before they get to work, even at home the night before or on the Sunday before they go to work, they're, they're arriving from a position of uncertainty that was never there before. Mm. You know, they might have had their own individual you know, imposter syndrome or doubts about whether they're good enough for this job or that job or what, whatever, it's just human nature kicking in. But now they're faced with, well, what happens next month when the business goes through another round of, of cuts? Mm. Is my job on the line? And, and that, that plays a part in the, the demand of the business hasn't changed. We still need to get this stuff out the door. Mm. Um, but we're doing it with a skeleton crew, with a new manager, and under the weight of, um, of, of uncertainty. And, and, and in uncertainty, you know, the, what, what with, with all these gaps that are present, what tends to happen is people just work harder because they don't have a solution or, mm. as we've explained already, they don't give themselves time to find a way to work through this better. So they just throw more at mm. it. They work, they working harder seems to be the answer. Mm. And, and, and that just adds to the, to the pressure and st stress that people put on themselves, people put on other people. Mm. Um, and that's, I think the, I don't think the demand has changed as in the direct uh, requirements of what performance looks like, but people are, are being asked to perform um, with a very different set of circumstances. So, so going forward, I mean, in the UK, we're starting to, I guess, come out of it. I say that sort of cautiously because <laughs> it's, it's yeah. been a long haul already. Um, as we start to come out and become poor post COVID sort of way of working, um, what would be your, I guess, advice to leaders at this point to ensure that we continue to meet the expectations of the demands of the game or uh, uh, in that sort of context, what would be your th thoughts on that for the next sort of six to 12 months? It's a toughie. I mean, it, obviously it, 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 it's a broad scope, broad scope response, but I think, I think in general, there's a, there's a real need for people. So the people that I work with, I work with, with leaders and managers and I work with their teams and, and a lot of the feedback is around um, understanding. I, I need to be better understood. I need to be appreciated more. I need to be recognized for the strengths that I bring to this team or this unit or this department. Mm. And when the job or the demands of the job or the, the work itself or the game, of the, the you know the player stepping up, or a team that's that's on a run of bad results. The demands of the game haven't changed, but but the perspective mm. and the the feeling and the emotion around it's volatile and uncertain. Am I mm. going to be in the team? Am I going to be? Am I going to have my job? It's all the same sort of stuff. Mm. And when 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 you're dealing with that, I think you, if you can if you can separate the person from the task or the person from the role which is really important, um, then the best thing that leaders and managers can do right now is care about the person mm. and value the person, respect the person, understand the person. Yeah. Um, because what I'm finding is that really we, we're not close enough to our people to know what it is that they're actually going through. Anecdotally, because mm. we're all going through it. Yeah. But some people are more resilient than others. Some people are, are cracking on with it and not face too much whatever happens happens but there's mm. lots that aren't and and if you're treating this with your own hat on and that's the only way you operate um then i think you're failing your people at the moment and mm. and you're not giving yourself or themselves the best chance to to be successful and to feel feel better about themselves in in the context of what's going on yeah and i think that's that's really good advice because i i think you know, some people, as you say, will be are more resilient than others and are dealing with it in different ways. Some people won't show you how they're dealing with it and perhaps they're not dealing with it. Um, unfortunately, some people just don't share. And I think there's that 
view of as you say just be more empathetic and get 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 with the person and trying to understand and and find ways of connecting with them in whatever shape i know a lot of people are still virtually at the moment uh, which is, is obviously more challenging but there is ways of doing it without feeling imposing on people uh, or using other people in the team you know in terms of peers to sort of get alongside and create those sort of social networks and sort of frameworks to help people and i think that's that's really important um any other thoughts in terms of going forward uh, in terms of pushing that through in terms of taking that empathy and what else in terms of i suppose inspiring people for the future yeah i was, I was going to say it's about inspiration then isn't it it's about understanding yeah. what motivates people and, and uh, again i can use a sporting analogy where when, when you're in the game um regardless of the score you know the score influences people's emotions significantly and how mm. people cope with that is you know can be decisive um but during a game you experience lots of opportunity and lots of uh touch points where you're praised for just one small element of what you do you might make a good pass and you get lots of instant feedback that that was great so regardless of the result you get told that with a good pass or a good tackle mm. or a good yeah that's a really positive uplifting environment to be involved in mm. um if you didn't have any of that and you only heard the booze or you only heard the coach yelling when things were going wrong um it would be a completely different environment so businesses have to find a way to recognize in the day-to-day -day, lots of the good stuff that's getting done yeah. and if that comes from a position of knowing what people's strengths are and when they show them and that has a a positive impact it's a great time to give feedback mm. uh, of course you then got when, when there's performance management required where there's substandard performance going on that needs to be dealt with it's coming from a position of balance where you've already you know mm. you're living in the world of positivity you 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 you're lighting fires under people you're putting them into environments where they're already mm. strong so you're giving yeah. them lots of opportunity to to receive positive feedback then you can say right hey this is not this is not quite what this has not hit the mark is there something we we need to have a conversation about mm. you know, it it changes the you know I, I use the term team dynamics a lot it it doesn't take much to to turn a a, a disengaged working group into a more engaged workforce just by applying simple simple principles like that mm. No, and I think that's important. It's that it's it's that sort of continuous feedback. It's not a, a yearly feedback uh, a process. It's a continual feedback, and you know, giving praise where it's due. Because I agree with you. Sometimes you may be part of a a big project, but the overall project might fail. But actually, your part was was really good in, in what yeah. you did. Unfortunately, something else slipped up or whatever it is, and actually people get caught up on the whole thing was a failure, but actually, no, you made some sort of steps. And I think that's really important. I like that whole thing. You know, you made a pass, it was really good, but the striker or whatever happened just didn't fall through, follow through in terms of a goal. Uh, I think that's important. Um, I really like the ideas of, of sort of business and sports because I think there really is some sort of correlations in terms of how they sort of operate. Um, how can people get hold of you? If they want to sort of connect with you and sort of um, get to know you a bit more. Um, LinkedIn's probably the best way, you know, Tony Wormsley forward slash um, or at, at the leadersadvisory.com, which is my website. Brilliant. Well, thank you for coming on today. And thank you for sharing your thoughts on uh, business and sport, Tony. It's an absolute pleasure, Julian. Thanks for having me.